Good morning and welcome to New Bethel Baptist Church. We're so glad you are with us today. We would love for you to participate in worship this morning. So sing along with the praise team, grab your Bible, and be ready to study God's Word in just a moment. Let's worship together.
lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, we lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, we lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. You alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can lift us from. Today we're continuing our sermon series from the book of Psalms called Songs for Summer. The song we're going to look at today was written as an acrostic in the Hebrew. Each line begins with a letter from the Hebrew alphabet. Now this was probably done to make the psalm accessible and easier for people to memorize. There are eight, well there are nine acrostic psalms. Two of them continue. Uh, the, the biggie is Psalm 119, which has eight verses each, which begin with an individual letter. Let me give you an example of an acrostic. An acrostic for the word summer would be sunshine, unwinding, memories, melons, entertaining, and relaxing. Summer. Let's read Psalm 34 together. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cries for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate righteousness will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him, will be 
condemned. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this encouraging word today. Let it be encouraging to us. Help us to understand, Lord, what you would teach us today from this. Where we lack wisdom, please give us wisdom. Where we lack understanding, please give us understanding. That we may live better, draw closer to you, that we may bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm calling this message, A Song in the Dark. Now, I'm, I'm calling it that because of where it was written and David, who's the author, his predicament when it was written. The heading of the psalm tells us about the time in David's life when this was written. It gives us the background, so to speak. David killed Goliath. We know that. And uh, he was invited to the palace. He became a favorite of King Saul for a time. Eventually, Saul became jealous of David's popularity and <laughs> threw spears at him. Now, I had a disagreement with a few bosses in my day, but, but at least none of them threw spears at me. David, in an unexplainable move, runs away from Saul and runs to the Philistines. Not only runs to the Philistines, but he runs to the city of Gath. That was the home of Goliath, the giant that David killed. I know, right? At Gath, they figured out who David was. And he discovers that they know. And so rather than, rather than fighting his way out, David pretends to be crazy, like scratching on walls, drooling, slobbering down into his beard, kind of crazy. When they, when they brought him before the king, who is named Achish, uh, in 1 Samuel 21, 10 through 15, you'll find that story. Here in the psalm, it, it says he, he is Abimelech. Uh, here in Psalm 34, he's that because that's the, the title of a Philistine king, like Pharaoh in Egypt or Caesar in Rome. When the king saw that David was crazy, he said, Do I not have enough crazy people around me? I, I got all the crazy I need. And, and they kicked David out, and he returned to Israel. Now, so David has enemies in the Philistines, and he is an enemy in Saul, and so he goes and hides out in the cave of Adullam. Now, while living in a cave, David writes this song, a song in the dark. Now, we might look at David's predicament and say he was uh, between a rock and a hard place. So what do you do when life turns hard? What do you do when it seems like the world is against you? To whom do you turn when it all goes dark? David tells us to bless the Lord. He tells us to fear the Lord, to seek the Lord, to take refuge in the Lord, to learn from the Lord, to cry out to the Lord, and to trust the Lord for salvation. So let's break this down and find out for ourselves what to do when we are staring into the darkness like David. Well, the first thing David says may be the most surprising. David says, I will bless the Lord. Now, look where we've come from in this passage. Psalm 1 and Psalm 127 said, blessed is the man. Psalm 32 said, blessed are the forgiven Last week, it was Psalm 33, which said, blessed is the nation. But David turns it around and tells us to bless the Lord. So here, here's the first point. Bless the Lord when you are saved. David was saved by the Lord. David faced Goliath and said, well, the Lord's going to win this battle. In 1 Samuel 17, 44 and 45, David is in front of Goliath. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. 
This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. God saved David from Goliath. God saved David when Saul tried to skewer him. Suddenly, Saul was a bad aim. When the Philistines had him cornered in Gath, God delivered him again. God saved David. And David's response was, bless the Lord, praise the Lord, exalt the Lord. To bless someone is to speak a good word over them or a good word about them. When God blesses us, he speaks a good word over us. When God blesses us, he says, redeemed. That's a good word. When God blesses us, he says, my child. That's a good word. When God blesses us, he says, not guilty. I really like that one. If we're going to bless the Lord, it means we speak a good word about Him. We talk about His goodness. We talk about His kindness. We speak about His generosity. To magnify the Lord means we tell how great He is. David tells us to praise the Lord continually. Now, David had good reason to boast. He was a champion over a giant in battle after battle with the Philistines and in the minds of the people. But David says in this passage, I will boast in the Lord. And then David calls others to join him in praising the Lord. Now, in this cave, David became surrounded by men who had escaped persecution, who had run away from forced slavery, who had done something perhaps illegal. These men were not the, the, the high and the noble. They were lowlifers, scum, the society might have said. But David teaches them. David converts them. He tells them, magnify the Lord with me. David invited them to honor the Lord. And he invites us in the same way to bless the Lord. He encourages us to invite others to exalt his name together. The second thing we see in this psalm is fear the Lord when you are afraid. Now, read intentionally through verses 4 through 7. You'll hear David say that he was in a bad way and the Lord delivered him him. He says, I was afraid. He calls himself poor. He, he gives us the picture that he was in trouble. So what does David say we should do when we're afraid or in trouble or poor? He says, the Lord encamps around those who fear him. The angel of the Lord, symbolically meaning the Lord himself. That was who would send an angel if it was just an angel. The Lord encamps around those who fear him. When you're afraid in the world, fear the Lord. When you're in poverty, physically, emotionally, or even financially, fear the Lord. When you are in trouble, fear the Lord. Now, this doesn't mean be frightened by the Lord. It, it doesn't mean to be scared or as we would say in the South, scared. This means reverence and awe. We see that very clearly in Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. It says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 10 tells us, and now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. He is your praise. He is your God who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. And the writer of Proverbs tells us, 
short and sweet, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. For us to fear the Lord means much more than just respecting the Lord. It means accepting Him, accepting His position on sin, accepting His position as judge of the sinner. It means we accept His discipline of the believer. It means we trust Him to love. It means we trust Him to keep His word and trust Him to save. Believers have no reason to be afraid of the Lord. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, Nothing can separate us from His love. Hebrews 13, 5 tells us, He will never leave you or forsake you. When you are in trouble, fear the Lord. Respect Him, accept Him obey Him, submit to Him, worship Him with awe and wonder. Verses 8, 9, and 10 tell us to look to the Lord when you lack. David says to the men gathered around him, and he says, therefore, to us, taste and see. Now, imagine trying to describe sweet to somebody who's never tasted anything sweet. It's like trying to describe red to a person that's colorblind. The best you can do, if you can, is to let them try it for themselves. Once they have tasted and once they have tried the Lord, they will know for themselves. They'll know for themselves. Let me ask you this. Can you untaste honey, you know what honey tastes like. You know that it is sweet. <laughs> there's, a, there's a chef that I like to watch on, on video on, on YouTube, and he makes something called rosemary salt. It's a mixture of herbs, including rosemary, uh, chiefly rosemary as an herb, and it's that in kosher salt, and he mixes it together. And whenever he uses it in a recipe, he'll say something like, If you know, you know. Well, David's telling us, Taste and see that the Lord is good, because when you know, you know. David says in verse 9, Those who fear the Lord, that is, those who have tasted the Lord's blessing and seen His mercy, he says they have no lack. Now, this is what Jesus would have us to understand when we go over into Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus said that. And then he said, his right, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Verse 10 says, the young lions suffer want. The king of the beast might go without. There are times when the strongest and most fierce might not have all they need. But, he tells us, those who have experienced the Lord and His mercy will have no lack. Now, this is not a, a prosperity gospel. It doesn't mean trust the Lord and all your bills will suddenly be paid. It means you'll have an, <laughs> you'll have an all-access pass to heaven. My son-in-law has to travel to California several times this year, finishing up a master's degree at California Baptist University. He paid, he went to the TSA, and he paid for a pre-check pass so he gets to skip the lines at the airport. Taste and see that the Lord is good, and you get a pre-check through to heaven. And in David's experience, those who have faith in the Lord, who take refuge in the Lord, who fear the Lord, who seek the Lord, they have a pass through the hard times here on earth. Not that, not that they avoid them, not that we avoid them, but we travel through them. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans 8, 28. And we know for, that for those who love God... All things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. 
David is telling us to try the Lord, to look to the Lord when we lack because following the Lord is sweet. Next, we are to learn from the Lord when you desire. Learn from the Lord when you desire. Here again, David is speaking to those who are beginning to gather around him. He says in verses 11 and 12, Come, O children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? So what do you want from life? What is it you desire? David sums it up with desiring life and seeing good. We might say, have a good life. These men were living in a cave. Some of them were running from the tax collectors. Some of them them were running from the law. All of them were poor. All of them were desperate. They're living in a cave. David says, gather around and I'll tell you about the good life. It's not the palace. It's not the, the king's banquet table. The good life, the good life is fearing the Lord. The good life is being in a right place, in a right relationship with the Lord. In verse 15, David says, The eyes and the ears of the Lord are on the righteous. God is there for the right ones, the righteous, the ones that are with him, the right ones, those that are right with him. David says, The good life is keeping your tongue from evil. (laughs) Really? These are some of the roughest men in the country. And David says, keep your tongue from evil. This passage, uh, Psalm 34, 12 through 16, is quoted by Peter as a blessing from our relationship with the Lord. And right before he gets to this quote, Peter uh, wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9. He says, all of you... Have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. And then he quotes this passage. Rather than a curse or rather than speaking evil, we are to bless We're to, James said, bridle our tongues. David said, learn from me. Now, perhaps perhaps this was an area David had to learn to control. And then he said simply, do good. Do good. Not ignoring others. Not getting what you can get. He says, proactively, do good. And then he says, seek peace. These men who are with David will become known as David's mighty men. These men will develop into the champion warriors in all of Israel. They will become the the personal guard of David when he becomes king. These men are to be respected and feared. And David's instruction to these mighty men, his instruction from the Lord is, Seek peace. And he taught them that. On two occasions, one or more of these men came to David and said, this is where and how you can get to and kill Saul. But David does not kill Saul. Both times, David tries peace with Saul. David lived this example. The Lord teaching through David says to do evil. If you do evil, the Lord has already forgotten you. Do good and the Lord hears you. John 14, 23, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and will come to him and we will make our home with him. So the Lord sees and hears and in verses 17 through 20, the Lord delivers 
and his delivery is near. So our next lesson in dealing with dark times is to cry to the Lord when you are crushed. Cry to the Lord when you are crushed. Now, I want you to listen to verses 17 through 20 again. Listen to these verses and listen for the pain and the problems in these verses. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears them and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Can you hear a, yeah, but, from the crowd? David's talking about the good life. David's talking about the Lord seeing and the Lord hearing. He, he says, bless the Lord at all times. Yeah, but someone says, we do not seem to be blessed or, or even watched over. And our prayers just seem to echo off the ceiling of this cave, cave, cave. Crying out to the Lord when you are crushed is just another way. David saying, have faith. Have faith. Put your confidence in the Lord. When those who are righteous or, or those who are right with God cry out to God, God hears them. When you are brokenhearted, God is close by. God saves. Now, this is not a promise of only good times. The passage is clear that both the righteous and the wicked will have afflictions, but the difference will be in the outcome. God will deliver you, if you are right with Him, from this world and into the perfect peace and the eternal goodness of heaven. And the wicked, He will not. Now, there's a second challenge that I see in these verses. Broken and crushed, uh, or broken hearted and crushed in spirit, those are... Those are terms that are often used in the Bible for repentance. This is the, the attitude we should have toward our own sin. When we are crushed by the weight of guilt of our own sin, God will deliver us from that weight. And then verse 20 may be speaking about those that are under the load of sin, that they will not be broken by it. Uh, because Jesus will lift that up off of us. But this could also be describing our deliverer. Jesus died on the cross, carrying the weight of our sin. He was different from the two criminals that were crucified with him that day. Uh, those two, their legs were broken to speed their deaths. Jesus gave his life, and when they came to him... They did not break his bones, for Jesus had already died on purpose. Finally, retreat to the Lord when your life is on the line. Retreat to the Lord when your life is on the line. Now, I just want to compare two statements in this part of it. It says, those who hate the righteous will be condemned. And then it says, the Lord redeems the life of his servant. Those who hate righteousness, those are the people who reject Jesus. Jesus was the most righteous person to ever live. He was righteousness embodied. Reject Jesus and you reject the only path to righteousness. Reject Jesus and there's only condemnation left. But re the Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. God will save you if you seek refuge, shelter, protection, 
forgiveness if you seek a right relationship with him. So when you are facing darkness, when you're between a rock and a hard place, turn to the Lord. Ask for forgiveness. Get right with him. And then you'll find that that cave is not a place of darkness, but it can become for you a place of preparation and a place of praise. And then you'll be able to say with David, I will bless the Lord at all times. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this word. Lord, help us when we are crushed by the world or by the weight of our own sin. Lord, we come to you. We, we come seeking shelter, refuge. We come seeking forgiveness from you. If we've ever accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then, then Lord, we know that we have that special relationship with you, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And we know, Lord, that, that those who cry out to you in the name of Jesus, seeking that forgiveness, will find it if they admit that they're sinners, if they believe who Jesus is, and if they'll confess those things to you. Father, we pray today, if anybody hasn't done that, that they will do that. Admit, believe, and confess. And Father, we ask that you would help us to, to be like David, to bless your name at all times, to praise you, to, to magnify you, and Father, to do that in front of others, that they too might learn to be encouraged, that they might learn to turn to Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.